Uh, welcome. My name is uh, James Kaplan. I'm a partner at uh, McKinsey and Company, and I lead our global uh, cybersecurity uh, practice. Welcome to our panel on cyber resilience. Uh, it seems every time anyone picks up the newspapers, uh, there's another article on a cyber attack or some sort of breach. Uh, in this session, we're going to talk about you know, what the implications are of cyber attacks and cybersecurity. How critical an issue is this for companies and for the broader economy? And we're going to talk a little bit about what individual institutions and society at large can do to make itself um, resilient. So we have a phenomenal panel uh, this morning. So I'm just going to go through the uh, group that we have. We have uh, uh, Catherine Allen, CEO of the Santa Fe Group, starting from uh, your left and my right. Then Commander Jonathan Kalwasser from Fleet Cyber Command of the US Navy. Tim Raines from Microsoft. Uh, Ray Rothrock, uh, CEO of Red Seal. And Andrew Rubin, CEO of Alumio. Alumio, excuse me. Did I get it right the you second did. time around? You did. Excellent. OK. Uh, so we're going to start out with uh, a question around why now? Why is cybersecurity important, more important now than it might have been five years ago? Why so much uh, more attention? Why so much more focus? Uh, from management teams and from boards of directors. Kathy, you want to start out by providing a perspective? I will, and I come out of the financial sector and we were the first hit. Uh, and I, I think part of this is the realization that we've moved beyond hacking for money to hacking for intellectual property to hacking for terrorist attacks. And I think the future uh, interests that all of us ought to have on cybersecurity is about cyber warfare and in particular attacks on the grid, the electric grid and other critical infrastructures. Jonathan, how about you? What's your thoughts on this issue? So my uh, background, uh, well first off, I am a commander in the United States Navy, but these views are my own and not uh, endorsement by the Navy or anything like that, legal disclaimer out of the way. Um, I've been involved directly with incident responses from the uh, US military, um, things that are attacking us, trying to go into most of the high profile attacks on us. Uh, I've actually led those type of teams. And so certainly when you look at the sophistication that's out there and the effect, uh, absolutely, that's a, a big issue, but the going beyond just the capabilities of the folks that are actually hacking us and looking at their intent, like, like Kathy was just talking about, you've got a trend of stealing intellectual property, right? That's just exploitation. But now you have a trend of disruption is okay, where we had distributed denial of service against our banking infrastructure, uh, things along those lines for a couple of years back in like 2012 timeframe. But uh, most recently, we start having Saudi Aramco being hacked, 30,000 computers, Sony Pictures being hacked, $350 million worth of damage. And then most recently, uh, we've got the uh, ransomware that's actually going out there that are actually destroying individuals' computers, affecting hospitals' ability to actually provide service. What ends up happening is, is we have a, that disturbing trend of it was exploitation was okay if you're the bad guy, um, then disruption and now destruction. And so that is the, the big issue, is it's not just a company's bottom line being affected because they lost some profit or had to do something, but literally companies can cease to exist overnight uh, as a result of a cyber attack. And so, so that's Jonathan, why. Jonathan, let me ask an entirely unfair follow-up question. If you were to put some sort of quantification on the increase of capability on the part of attackers over the past five years, what do you say? Is it a 50% improvement in sophistication, a doubling, a tripling, some other number? How would you how would you describe that? So I would look at it in multiple ways. So certainly uh, there's been an increase and it is uh, on the orders of minutes versus hours and days previously. So you're looking at several hundred percent uh, capabilities between it because they're they're basically investing in ways in which there are speed, precision and agility capabilities where when they get in, they have automated in the same way that we automate our defenses and try to figure out how to be more effective with less people. They are figuring out how to take the initial exploitation, automate that from a spearfish event or whatever that somebody clicked on an email, but going beyond that where it's the, the back doors being installed, they're moving around the network, they're actually gathering information that they need to do, all completely automated without a human being involved, then the humans come in and actually look at the data and figure out where they need to go after that point. So what ends up happening is, is because they have added those same investments in their capabilities, 
it's making them extremely effective and now we need to move on the order of seconds to minutes not hours to days and if you look at most of the recent uh, reporting whether it's FireEye's report or um, uh, Verizon's report you're talking about hundreds of days before we notice an attack going in and so what ends up happening is it's a very real threat because of they're moving at a different speed than we are. What do you think Tim about the speed? Is it, has it moving from minutes to seconds? Uh, certainly I agree that the uh, the bad guys operationally are getting better and better but but frankly I mean you know I've been at Microsoft for a couple decades in the last 10 years you know we founded the customer facing incident response team and I've done that work for a long time and we've published the Microsoft Security Intelligence Report for 10 years now and I can tell you in all of that time there's only four ways that organizations get compromised right so you've got weak passwords misconfigured systems uh, unpatched vulnerabilities and um, uh, Geez, the fourth one? People. Uh, it'll come People. To People. 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 Oh, social engineering. How can right. I forget, forget that? that. Yeah. Uh, but frankly, in all this time, that those are the four ways that, that organizations continue to get uh, compromised. So, it, you know, it's are, are attackers really getting more sophisticated? They're still using those same four ways. Certainly operationally, as, as he mentioned, I mean, they're getting much, much better. They're organized. They've got tools. They've got really good tools. Mm -hmm. They're automating things so they can move faster. But when you start to step back, it really is this, it's old wine in new bottles. It really is the same old game that they've been playing for a long, long time. Well, let me, let me say, is, let me ask uh, Jonathan and Tim to comment on something. Is it possible that there's a divergence between the national security, cybersecurity arena versus the commercial cybersecurity arena? Is there a situation that for attackers with, you know, private sector attackers engaged in uh, attacks for monetary reasons, they're leveraging, you know, phishing attacks, unpatched, unpatched systems, but for attackers, you know, attempting to penetrate the national security infrastructure, it's in much more sophisticated, supported by nation states. Right. right. So the, the key here is, is the, the nation state actors that are out there are still using the same tactics, exactly like Tim talked about. What they do beyond that, after the initial exploitation, I think is what the differentiation between them. But absolutely, spear phishing, still effective. Um, people still haven't learned uh, not to, to click when they, when sh they shouldn't. Um, and so there's a continuous problem there. But it's a delta between what they do after that point that really differentiates between if they are um, a crime syndicate that's just trying to get in in order to uh, steal right. data and money uh, type of thing versus going after yeah. national security secrets. The, the intent issue is really important. The difference between hacktivists who may want to get in to exploit a company or to harm their reputational risk um, or a terrorist or a group that's looking at destruction of a company or destruction of the grid or, or uh, the telecommunications network. Very different uh, the intent and power that they have than the hackers that we saw in the financial services industry, which primarily and continue uh, to uh, move money from one place to the other. And oftentimes that hacking is of terrorist groups because that's how they fund a lot of the terrorist activity. So I, I think that's what makes this so difficult for everybody is the lack of attribution on the internet. Mm -hmm. You don't know who's attacking you and since you don't know who it is, you don't know what motivates them. Is it money? Is it uh, hacktivism, as, as Kathy mentioned, is it uh, economic espionage, military espionage? You can't tell. And so since you can't do attribution very well, uh, you're left wondering who is attacking me and what's motivating me or motivating them. And then that makes it hard to understand who should be involved in the response. Should the military be involved? Is it Department of Homeland Security? Is it local law enforcement? Is it industry? Since we can't do attribution very well, it makes it very, very difficult to figure out what a proportional response looks like. Ray, what's, um, uh, first, after you introduce yourself, I was hoping you could comment on what you see people being concerned about. What's the balance of concern between um, destruction versus exploitation versus intellectual property versus fraud and so forth? Thanks, so uh, Ray Rothrock, CEO of Red Seal. I've been CEO for two years, but I was a VC for 25 years before that and, and led uh, investments in many very successful cyber companies, Checkpoint, Imperv, Avantu, and others. So I've been a student of this field for a very long time, and we are definitely in a new category now. Uh, I think the balance uh, is, is it really, uh, there is no balance. It doesn't matter uh, whether you're uh, <laughs> under bad. attack. For, it's all bad whether you're under attack because, look, 
Uh, and I also I want to comment, I think both the sort of the national security and commercial security, they're also intertwined. Because mm -hmm. yes. look, this country in the West runs on economies, and economies are based on businesses, and businesses have to do things, uh, sell products and make profits and margins. And cyber is a cost, mm -hmm. and it's going up. The numbers I see suggest that we're not winning. Even if you continue to double your cyber budgets, we're not winning. The losses are outpacing what we can apply there. So we've got to be smarter, which gets to the point of resilience because uh, prevention doesn't work. I invested in 15 prevention companies, had a very <laughs> nice career, but those days are gone. It's time for, it's time for a new, to get control, to get control, to get these things resilient so that they don't fall down. Networks are very fragile. They've been built for decades by people with different purposes. And how do you know, the things you mentioned, uh, <laughs> Tim, about uh, misconfigurations and all that, that is so true. And we have to basically rebuild our infrastructure, our digital infrastructure, so that the national economy, as well as the commercial, national security and the commercial economy will operate. It is in the Constitution to provide for the common defense. Mm -hmm. I think there's an obligation there. Yeah, that, that old fashioned view that you do protection and recovery. Yeah. The underlying assumption of that security strategy is that if you do protection well enough, you'll never get breached. Right. And we know Those that that's wildly right. optimistic. Yeah. Right. And so now you got to look at protect, detect, and respond and start to invest yeah. in detection and response capabilities that you never looked at before. So and the yeah. challenge so, that I see is as U.S. military, it's my job to put myself in harm's way in order to protect citizens of the United States. In cyber, that's very difficult for me to do. I can try to send folks out there, but presidential policy actually prohibits me from sending military forces into commercial networks. Um, I've got to figure out other ways in which to defend you because I can't put myself in between due to the nature of cyber and how things work. Speed of light from the attacker directly into your <laughs> infrastructure, that makes it very difficult for the Department of Defense to be there. So we have to look at other ways that I can actually use the mission of defend the nation that, uh, that we actually have in order to figure out um, how to stop the adversaries from getting in your network. So it's, it's certainly a challenge that requires participation by all yes. players. Yes. Andrew, if you could introduce yourself and talk a little bit about why you think this is, why now? Why is this a, a tougher issue now than would have been the case in the past? Sure, so I'm Andrew Rubin. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Illumio. Um, and um, there was something that just got said that I think I'm gonna use and build on, which is security had a mission for a couple of decades. Mission was very simple, and if you were a CISO, you went to your CIO. If you were a CIO, you went to your CEO and board, and you said, give me more money, and it was always against a single mission. Give me more money so I can buy more things, more people, more process, and keep us safe. The more money you give me, the more things I'll buy, the more people I'll hire, the safer we'll be, which is sort of ironic, because you can't be more safe than safe. You're either safe or unsafe. <laughs> and in the last couple of years, the question that everybody should be asking is, why did it change all of a sudden? For 20 years, we did this. We did a lot of these same things, and there was no Sony, there was no Target, there was no JP Morgan, there was no OPM. And when they did happen, they didn't seem to make the front page of every newspaper every time it took place. And so there's a couple of threads that I think have come out. One is, um, I was at a lunch on Saturday leading into the conference, and somebody got up and said that 90% of the data in the world's been created in the last two years. So if you're in our business, the way you look at that, I say collectively all of our businesses, the way you look at that is the attack surface that we've created for cyber is growing so exponentially that it's now parabolic. <laughs> there is no conceivable way to protect an attack surface that's growing this fast, and certainly not with the tools and the things that we did in the past. Um, the second one that I know has resonated quite a bit with some of our customers is that attackers tend to think in graphs and defenders think in lists. And if you've ever written a firewall rule or tried to protect anything even in the physical world, graphs work much better than lists. And it's backwards that we're protecting ourselves in a very manually driven way against an attacker that is taking advantage of every piece of automation, every piece of software, and every piece of agility they can get their hands on. So we're losing partly because of how we're fighting the war. We haven't actually awoken and said, this is a fundamentally different war. The attack surface is exponentially larger than anything we ever thought we would have to defend. Let's think about it differently. And I think where security now inherits a second mission to bring it back to the comment about keeping us safe is no longer enough. There's nobody in the cyber business who would ever advocate for stopping the mission of trying to stay safe. So if you build a data center and put valuable applications and data inside, put a perimeter up if you can. Because the first goal is to try and keep that environment safe. But there's now a second mission for security, which is very simple. 
reduce the surface area of attack so inevitably when a bomb goes off, the blast radius is substantially smaller than it otherwise would have been. And there are some very real things that you can do today that even a few years ago you couldn't do. And there are words that the industry has come up with like segmentation and compartmentalization or ring fencing your high value assets. And all of these words really mean the same thing. Make sure that part of your security mission is charged with saying, when we lose, how do we reduce the impact of the loss? But that requires acknowledging that you're going to lose sometimes. And that's actually one of the most interesting things that I think has changed. Ray, you, uh, you said something interesting a couple of minutes ago. Um, you said we need to rebuild our digital infrastructure. Could you talk a little bit about what that means? Yeah, the, the infrastructure we have now, we have no documentation for. We really don't know much about it. And the people that built it are probably in another job or retired. So uh, we really don't know what it looks like. And uh, I think just picking up on Andrew's point, I think he's exactly right. We have to prioritize mm -hmm. what elements of our infrastructure are important to protect, whether it's from a resilience point of view, can you survive an attack, can you, can you operate right through the impairment, whatever that is, uh, to the point of making sure the configurations. I think actually the most fundamental thing we got to do is we got to stick cyber hygiene in our education system. <laughs> That's password, changing passwords, <laughs> all that. Uh, you know, using VPNs or what, whatever. That's Some people I, I have noted that cybersecurity that. isn't even part of our computer science education. It is not, right. in fact. Uh, they view it as a yeah. implementation <laughs> problem. Right. <Yes. laughs> Encryption is not even taught in most graduate schools. It's shocking to me. But, uh, but absolutely, uh, these these systems are fragile. They 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 break. They don't under, if if they break, uh, you can lose connections. Uh, people forget to, to simply do upgrades. You may recall last July, uh, July eighth, I think it was. United Airlines, Wall Street Journal, and um, the New York Stock Exchange were all down at the same time. It was not a cyber attack, even though the Twitter feed said it was Pearl Harbor again. <laughs> it was simply a router upgrade. This stuff is fragile. It breaks. And if it breaks and you're down, you're out of business. And being out of business is bad. Can Tim, I is, it, is it possible to imagine a much less fragile network infrastructure, or is that overly optimistic? No, I think it's, uh, it's very possible. So. Uh, one of the keys, I think, that, that Andrew mentioned is this idea of, a, of an intelligent security graph. So today, the way that people are trying to compensate for, for what they're talking about is they started with investments in firewalls and antivirus many years ago. Mm -hmm. And then they realized that the way to try to beat the bad guys is to gather a bunch of data and understand whether you've been compromised already or, or where you're right. going. So right. now they've invested in security incident and event monitoring systems. Same. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now they realize that that only gives them a view into what's happening to them. So they go out and they purchase multiple third-party threat intelligence feeds to understand what's happening to other people. Problem is, is finding people to man that and analyze yeah. it and all that takes time. And it's very often a history lesson before you can make any, any right. response to that. What, you know, an, another way to look at this is with the cloud. And I think the cloud is a game changer for security because when you take a look at the scale of those infrastructures and the way that they, you know, they're much newer than a lot of the on-premises infrastructures mm -hmm. we're talking about here. If you look at, for instance, the Microsoft Cloud, we do 14 billion authentications a day from all over the world. That much signal gives us a pretty good idea of what the bad guys are trying to do, whether they're trying to log into your mm -hmm. infrastructure from somewhere else in the world. It's very easy to pick that stuff out from the data, especially with machine learning systems. So that does add resilience to the infrastructure, and that's why so many organizations are starting to embrace the cloud, because they realize you can do it in an environment like that today, in a modern environment, a lot easier than you could on-premise. Well, let me test that. Is it, is it purely scale or is the real potential game changer here that there's new architectures being built with a much higher degree of automation and much higher degree of consistency or standardization? I think uh, innovation is the key here, right? So a lot of people are trying to do this on premise by, by hiring security experts to look at indicators of compromise. <laughs> and what you really need to do is use machine learning on vast amounts of data to do it in real time. You need to be able to do that protection, stop the bad guys before they get in, or if they're already in, detect them and where they're at. So you can't do that with yeah. massive data sets without an army of people. Machine learning is really what helps you do that. So one thing though, I, um, I, I'll throw a little bit of controversy into the panel, tiny little bit. Um, so uh, we work with 
predominantly global enterprise, customers like Morgan Stanley, Salesforce. Um, and one of the learning lessons, and it was a painful one to go through, was when we launched our software into the market about a year and a half ago, we had this vision that the whole world was moving to the cloud and everybody is, <laughs> of course, fully virtualized. And why would you do anything with manual keyboards when you can okay. do it through automation and orchestration? And I went to New York and London and sat in meetings with these large enterprises who looked at me slightly cockeyed and said, so you do know you live in the valley and you're delusional. Right. Um, so our problem is we have this 99.6% of our production infrastructure that's running on things that we duct taped and band-aided together for the last give or take 25 years. And we have a cyber problem over here. And the over here is like where all of your data is stored and where all of your apps run and where all your transactions take place. And where all so, the trades gets processed and so forth. Et cetera, et cetera. And so, we do care very deeply about what we could do to not screw it up in the future as badly as we did in the past, but how are you going to help us over here? And it was actually, I say it somewhat teasingly, jokingly now, but it was a very big aha moment. So I'll give you an example of something that came out of some of these conversations. We do a remarkably bad job of taking lessons that we've learned for give or take a few thousand years in the physical world and simply ripping them off and using them in the cyber world. So for instance, the federal government in the United States has lots of buildings. I would imagine their real estate portfolio is incredibly impressive if you actually saw a list. What do we do to protect the White House differently than we do most of the other buildings, maybe every other one? We overinvest like crazy. The amount of technology, people, process, money that goes into protecting what is ironically nowhere near the largest building that the federal government has is so disproportionate. But there's a reason why we do it, and we keep upping it every year. It's a high value asset. There's lots of people who want to attack it. There are very important things in people inside. And there's also something else. There's a ripple effect if it does get attacked successfully. It's not just the cost of rebuilding the building. It's the symbolic problem that it would cause. It's the lack of confidence in can we protect anything if we can't protect this. So what do we do? There's a simple answer. We overinvest like crazy in protecting this thing that we've deemed a high value asset. I hate to scare all of you, but if you go to your bank, presumably a large one, and you look at the data center, I assure you that generally speaking for the last couple of decades, the database that has the amount of soda and coffee that they drink sits next to the one that has your credit card number. And generally speaking from a cyber perspective, most of the time they're protected the same way behind one firewall. So Jonathan, does how, how, how far along is the U.S. Navy in thinking about? So real quick, I wanted to, to follow up on uh, what, what Tim just talked about. I've been on incident responses into a cloud environment, and I certainly agree that cloud helps with compliance and helps with that. But if there is a problem in the security architecture of the cloud, it would then be inherent by most of the cloud, because most of the time it's just copies of the same machine over and over again. And so one of the things I've seen is, is the lessons learned that Andrew was just talking about becomes easy to apply it to a large amount of machines, but you have to have learned that lesson in the first place. The first time you get compromised, okay, then you make your, your, uh, your defenses a little bit better. Um, and then the cloud actually allows you to apply that lesson across that large amount of people. But if there is an inherent vulnerability in the cloud, you are now more vulnerable as a result of it because you right. now have a very... Um, you have a monoculture. Exactly, and a homogeneous network. Well, put it put another way, <coughs> Your learning scales, and so does the attackers. Correct. Right. Okay. So, uh, um, but I will, let me inject oh, here, James. The, please. The, this monoculture thing. So, I mean, years and years and years ago. I mean, I, we probably all read the the white paper from the guy that worked at Sun on monoculture, right? <laughs> What's happened since then in these operating systems? I'll use Windows as, as an example because I'm most familiar with it. <laughs> is we've injected a bunch of security mitigations into the OS that adds artificial diversity. So ASLR and DEP and CHOP, like all of these memory safety features make every single Windows box look like they're different. There's no monoculture anymore. And the same things now, Apple's adopted that, Google's adopted. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you really do have a monoculture, it's true, I mean, all the systems probably come from the same group of vendors, all of the routing and switching equipment and so on. Mm -hmm. But we're able to actually inject artificial diversity into that population so that it's much, much more difficult for attackers to be successful. So for instance, when I started the incident response job at Microsoft, started that on a Thursday, 
so that Saturday, SQL Slammer hit the internet. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that was successful is a worm that went around the world in about 15 minutes is because every single vulnerability was at the same memory location on every single mm -hmm. SQL server in the world. Today that could never happen because that memory location is randomized on every single server in the world. Mm -hmm. So if the worm knows where it is on one box, it's not going to hit the next box. That scenario now has largely gone away forever. Right. Yeah, but would you agree, Tim, that cloud is especially interesting? You know, or whether you, it's internal cloud or external cloud, in the sense that the automation and the standardization allows for massively more visibility than you would have previously. But at the same time, um, it creates additional points of leverage. That means that an attacker could that an attacker could potentially exploit. Is that correct? So. This is the way I look at it, like the scenario that we just talked about where all the individual organizations around the world are trying to collect threat intel and do their yep. own threat intelligence. Okay, so when you have all of that signal, high, high quality signal in one place, mm -hmm. arguably you know more about what's happening in that environment than anybody else in the world could about their own specific environments. That's what we're trying to do with our cloud is exactly what John mentioned is, learn what happened with these customers over here. They got some sort of uh, malformed PDF attachment and email from North Korea. It ended up in his inbox. We, we remote detonate it and learn all about it, tear it apart, see what it does. And now we can protect everybody else in the world from that same thing happening because we saw one incident of that right. in the entire world. So that type of threat intelligence, big data, machine analytics, all of that stuff is extremely powerful when it comes to cyber. Do you share that information back to the government and to other companies besides Microsoft? You bet, so what we're trying to do is surface that information in products and services. And so a great example right now, it's in, it's in public preview, is called Azure Active Directory Identity Protection. So for, I'll give you an example of the kinds of data that it surfaces. So if do, someone- Do you charge me for that sharing? Do I have to buy it? Uh, if you're using, you, you would only use it if you're an Azure Active Directory customer I in the see. first place. So I've bought Azure. You have to be a customer. Right. Yeah, right. So, okay. mm -hmm. so yes. if someone logs into your corporation, let's say in Boston, and then 10 minutes later they log in from Beijing, you would see that information. If someone's logging into your, your uh, assets from a known botnet, so we, we collect millions yeah. and millions of botnet IP addresses, you will see that information. If someone logs in from a machine that we know is infected with malware, you'll get that information. And so, because you have, you're centrally managing all of this stuff in the cloud, the, one of the biggest benefits is reporting. Yeah, well my question is, do you share it with other, do you share it with Amazon, for example, sure. so that their cloud can be protected? So this, this week, we're actually releasing the latest version, I mentioned this earlier, the Microsoft uh, Security Intelligence Report. Uh. We publish that twice a year. It's got data in it from hundreds of millions of systems around the world and the internet's busiest services. So we've been, and this is its 10 year anniversary, so we've been publishing that twice a year for 10 years. The other thing we do is we have a, our digital crime unit has a botnet IP address feed for governments, for uh, national cert teams, so that they can get those IP addresses and then work with the ISPs whose customers have been you know, taken advantage of, right? So we do supply that information to people that can take action to remediate it. Jonathan, let me ask you a question. As someone who's responsible for a, um, you know, fleet defense, um, I imagine there's a lot of ferment in the US Navy right now about how IT might change, whether it's cloud, DevOps, agile, what have you. <coughs> um, given all this change, how are you guys thinking about how the cybersecurity model evolves? Is it additional risk, additional benefit? Is it just different? How do you, how do you guys think about that? So we see it uh, kind of in two different ways. Uh, first and foremost is, is uh, we've got a limited budget just like everybody else does. So one of the things that you have to do real quickly is identify what's critical inside your organization and you tie it back to mission and uh, the things that you have to protect the most. And so what we d are doing is uh, we, we like to look for areas that we can actually clearly map that back to a mission failure. So if something gets compromised, I can say that some critical mission was actually compromised and ends up failing in the military sense. And so what ends up happening is, is that becomes a priority for investment, for where we actually need to expend people, processes, and technology and resources in order to make sure that those areas of the network are actually clearly defended more so than the rest. And then the other piece that we're actually doing is, is making sure that we actually have the people 
to be able to actually execute that. So one of the things Congress authorized a couple of years ago is uh, the new cyber mission forces and making sure that uh, we actually had people that were trained in this skill set because it's relatively rare. I don't have that privilege of, of uh, paying the extra money in order to get somebody that's truly good at this. I've got to build it from high school graduates. Hmm. And so what ends up happening is, is invest where we need to go based upon mission that I'm protecting and then make sure that they're equipped with the capabilities to be able to do that. That's really where our focus is. Ray, you've been around a long time and you've seen companies come and go. Um, to your thinking, are the broad changes in the IT operating model, are they making things harder or easier from a security standpoint? The companies that are out there now? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, there's like 1,400 cyber companies, and I think about yeah. 1,390 of them have got it all wrong. All right. Um, <laughs> what, the how five they have invested in have got it all right. Yeah. <laughs> what, what are they, uh, well, let, let me, let me, well, they, let me not let that pass. No, what, how are they getting it all they're wrong? They're investing in prevention. Right. They're providing prevention products, and mm -hmm. you have to, that's jacks are better, you gotta do it. Yeah. But it won't save you at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So I think that's uh, uh, an issue. Um, the second is intelligence, speaking on Tim's point, there is a lot of activity now to collect this information, to give it back. It's a, it's a burden, it's a cost, but it is very smart. I think there's a lot of companies doing that. That's a change in the IT uh, investment, if you will. And then sort of the final is, there's, not, there's like a million and a half job openings right now in cyber in the U.S. So everybody's shaking their heads, so they agree. Uh, there's not a million and a half people to fill that job. Right. So it's going to take a lot of automation. So I, if we could get all that venture capital and all those entrepreneurs uh, that are focused on prevention to start thinking about how do we, how do we give a tool that will answer the question, how to provide control, provide that... Uh, a measurement of resilience so that a board can make a decision. Jamie Dimon cannot double his budget year after year after year in cyber, his bank will be broke. So there is an impending crisis between what the boards can invest in, the measurements they need in order to get things done and to make good and prudent decisions based on priorities uh, that Andrew talked about. Yeah, the White House, obviously, I mean, the, the, it's the, I don't think it's the phys it's the confidence issue. That's the biggest issue I think that the IT department has to worry about now. That's why we're even caring about it. That's why we're talking about it. Well, let's take a step back for a minute. And just, um, it'd be great to address the impact that cybersecurity and concerns about cyber attack could have and is having on the broader economy, on technology innovation, on the pace of digitization, on supply chains. Uh, Kathy, I was wondering if you could reflect on that for a minute or two. I, I will, and I, I kind of look at it at a macro level, a firm level, and actually the individual level, and I'll give a couple of illustrations. Um, my company is focused on third party and fourth party, fourth party risk, and so we have corporations that are working on um, not only best practices, but assets, uh, the, the kinds of assessments that you need to do. And we're seeing increasingly the threat coming from third parties, not from the actual firm, but but somehow the connection that you have with third parties or their lack of uh, due diligence. And so you think about what's at stake at a macro level is if you're undermining the financial systems, whether it's from uh, the markets and manipulating the markets or it is bringing down a financial system or even the most recent um, a heist from the Federal Reserve Bank in uh, New York, uh, you, you start to undermine that confidence, which is where the point you were um, talking about, because in the financial systems, it's all about confidence. And if we don't have the confidence that we can transmit and transfer money in a uh, secure manner, that brings about anarchy. We even saw it when we had the global, and this is why I worry so much about the grids, because I think if I were a terrorist, that's what I'd be focused on. If you bring down the electric power in, uh, in a country, and the Ukraine is an example of that, and you can't bring it back up that quickly, you are going to have anarchy. So it's going to impact the economy, it's going to impact the social welfare of the people in that area, and it's also going to impact the financial systems. That's at a macro level. At a firm level, you have reputational risk, you have operational risk, you have the fact you could be out of business for a period of time. What does that do for your stock price, your, um, your employees, your constituents? Um, and you also lose IP. 97% of firms in the U.S have been hacked. And many boards and many C-suites will tell you, oh no, we haven't. And they don't even know it. So I think that's one of the, the problems is this disconnect between 
um, boards and the C-suite understanding that this is a macro problem as well as a firm level problem. It's not just a financial services industry problem. And then the last um, one is on personal privacy and personal security. Uh, you, all, you may not know this, but one of the big sellers this Christmas was Hello Barbie. It's a doll that your child can interact with. They're capturing the voice prints of the child interacting with that doll, and it's put into a database. The dolls have already been hacked, where someone with malicious intent would ask, you know, is your mommy at home, or what's your address, <laughs> things like that. And, and that's pretty scary when you think about at an individual level, if you've got Echo, if you have Siri, all of that, the data is being collected, and there is the ability to capture your voice, voice print. So on an individual level, I think people are gonna start to feel less secure, both financially, but also just as a personal security. So those are the kind of concerns of why cyber and us, we cannot address this issue, you were talking about uh, information exchange, unless the, the software and hardware providers that are there, the users are there, the government is there. This is a global issue and it can only be solved in that kind of macro sense. Tim, how big is this issue of trust? Do we run, do we run the risk of uh, a, a diminution of trust in the digital economy? Absolutely, people won't use technology they don't trust. And so, you know, that's now 13, 14 years ago um, at Microsoft, Bill Gates wrote the famous trustworthy computing memo. And that's mm -hmm. really the basis of it, is if we don't get serious about security and privacy and reliability and business practices, people will lose faith in technology. And that's not a good thing. And so, um, you know, we've invested an enormous amount of resources at Microsoft over the years to try to earn that trust. And it, I'll tell you, once you lose it, it's a, sh it's a very, very difficult thing to earn back. Trust is dynamic. You trust some people more than you trust others. You trust some people in some, you know, with some things, but not with others. So trust is a very interesting concept. And, and uh, when you mix that with technology, uh, most of it that's, you know, built on top of uh, protocols that were built 50 years ago when, uh, you know, they had no idea uh, how much this stuff would get scaled out and the kinds of adversaries that would try to take advantage of it, um, it's just a super hard thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. How about those There's, autonomous cars? Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. There's, there is one thing, though, that isn't sort of computed into the discussion, which is, um, which is going to end up, I'm sure, being very important, but nobody knows what to do with it, which is there's not a single person in this room that grew up from two years old with an iPad and an iPhone in your hand. <laughs> right. And I say that, and I know everybody sort of rolls their eyes and laughs, but if you've seen a three-year-old sitting in a restaurant with an iPad recently, they don't need to ask how to enter the password or what the difference is between one app and another. And so there's an intrinsic conditioning going on right now with a group of people that's presumably a lot younger than everybody sitting in this room and none of us have any idea exactly how that plays out and it's sort of cute when it's an iPad but it actually affects what their condition is in terms of what they're willing to share the fact that they just simply assume that everything you do is done through your phone including your banking so we haven't seen that play out yet but if you look at the early indications it's a fundamentally different mindset inside a 12 year old versus what everybody here sort of watched all this happen and has the ability to measure risk against how you used to do it when you walked up to the teller versus what you're doing now with your phone and how comfortable you feel. Right. The people who are growing so up with Andrew, this today, are that there, doesn't exist. Are there trade-offs between innovation and trust or will the sort of rising generation of digital natives make that less relevant? So um, I, I, I'll speak to the enterprise because it's easier than trying to figure out what you know a handful of tens of millions of millennials are going to do with all of this. Um, and post-millennials. And post-millennials, mm -hmm. um, and then post-post-millennials. Um, so at the enterprise level, and, and actually I'll make it very anecdotal. Before I came over this morning, I was on a 7 a.m. conference call with a customer back east, and the exact conversation we were having were workloads moving to AWS and Azure. This is a project that has been stamped by the CIO and the CEO. Um, you can imagine all the reasons why the CEO cares. It's about agility, it's about speed. There's some argument about if we're gonna be globally competitive, then how do we not take advantage of these things? And I, of course, was on the phone with some of the people that actually have to make sure that those workloads are secure. And the stuff that we do back home that we've done for 20 years that we know and love, we can't do them the exact same way in AWS and Azure. So how do we deal with it, right? It was a more of a tactical conversation, but the overarching theme was the same thing, which is, we've been told we have to do this. If we're gonna be competitive and agile, and it's a global economy, we have to take advantage. 
The people saying that are the people here, the board, the CEO, sometimes the CIO. But then there's this operational problem of how do we actually secure and run all these things and be able to look all those people in the eye upstream and say, it's going to be all right. We're not taking undue risk doing it. And so I actually think there's sort of a friction point right now that's really fascinating to watch playing out, which is you need to be agile. You have all these great words around being able to move with speed. And then is security getting in the way? Is it going to figure it out and jump in and go for the ride? And nobody seems to have a cohesive answer to that all the way around. So Ray, given that, given that you know, the risk of an incredible, is a strategic, almost existential issue, given you have all these complicated issues of innovation and trust and consumer experience and interaction with an evolving IT operating model, how do, how do, what should companies do? How should they be addressing this as more than just a technology issue? How do they get in front of the, uh, this issue to your thinking? Wow. Uh, well, we need to That's come why up. it's easier being the moderator. Yeah, than it is. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think we need to come up with some standards by which we can measure these capabilities, controls, and uh, security technologies. Um, Andrew's company has a terrific uh, cloud segmentation capability, but how do, how do you measure it? How do you, how do you convince people who don't have a clue what a cloud is, what security is, or any of that? How do, how do you give them something tangible that they can make a decision? Okay, it worked, or did it work? Okay, it worked, let's do it again. So I think there's uh, a conversation, much like we have gap and financial accounting systems and rules and all that, we need similar things here. Otherwise, it's just gonna blow up in our face and no one will understand what really is happening. So I, I actually think we start simple, and just like we started with simple you know, revenue uh, operations and, and profits, we start simple and we just build it up over time until we get a handle on it. I, I, because people are going to have to make decisions and make these investments, and they don't, they should not be expected to be cyber experts right. like many of us are. That's just not possible. So, so we follow on that, please. on that real quick. So, exactly right. And there's a, a lesson to learn from a hundred years ago when we start talking about electricity. How many people have looked at the plugs and see that UL right. written mm -hmm. on a plug? Right. Underwriters Laboratory is what that stands for. Um, there's actually a me an effort underway right now uh, where uh, Peter Zacco is a uh, well-known hacker that's out there is actually trying to figure out how to create a cyber underwriters laboratory so that you can put some type of stamp on there and evaluate whether or not a company that says they have encryption and they're actually doing it the right way and that type of stuff can actually be objectively assessed to make sure that they're actually doing it correctly with the right lessons learned and that type of stuff. So I have a lot of hope that uh, the Cyber Underwriters Laboratory will actually help with that. But yeah. certainly we need some sort of body that can do that. Let me just, uh, MIT is looking at a cyber test bed. Los, Al Los Alamos National Labs are beginning to look at a cyber test bed. And it's that concept of where the software hardware systems are tested and then there's some kind of a certification or a perspective that at least helps you as a buyer to know that they have been tested. It, there's a lot of resistance to that from the software, hardware, sure. mm -hmm. systems the providers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's going to have to be something uh, that's more of a coalition of, again, the user groups, <laughs> uh, the technology players, and the government to make that happen. Some things will actually force it a little bit faster. There's been some conversation. Obviously, cyber insurance has become a very big topic. And you know, uh, it, we're mm -hmm. maybe in the first pitch of the first inning, it feels like, of figuring out what it's going to be and how it's going to work. That's a good but um, there's been a lot of conversation around no differently than when you drive your car well for a prolonged period of time your rate goes down if you do certain things now we'd have to actually define those things and then we'd have to right. approve them mm -hmm. but there's this motion around the commercial motion may help force some of these things like the UL right. for cyber right. because if you want to go buy cyber insurance you're gonna to have to be able to attest to certain things that you've done and certain ways to do it and it'll be cheaper if you do it better mm -hmm. Very so, I, so I, I would add I don't, you know the UL concept has been around a long time mm -hmm. but we have other things sort of that predate that right so we've got standards Right, ISO 27034 is the International Standard for Secure Development. How many companies here can certify that they're doing ISO 27034 Secure Development when you create your apps, right? <laughs> right. So there's a lot of people that talk about different ways to measure cyber, but there's already a huge body of work available out there. We've been doing the security development lifecycle at Microsoft. Yeah, but if you said that in the boardroom, Tim, nobody's going to care. But let me ask this question. What is the role of the board? Right. 
What should the board? Uh, what, the board allocation. What, uh, yeah. Yeah. What's, what's, what's the hands. question? What should the board be asking? Uh, what okay. the, uh, and by the way, I do have some handouts over here on what uh, <laughs> boards board should be asking uh, of their uh, C-suite about uh, cybersecurity. I chair a security committee, both physical and cyber, for a electric utility, which is why I keep worrying about the grid. And I also uh, helped set up a risk committee for a regional financial services company. And before that was involved in the 100 largest banks and setting standards around this issue. And it's a big issue. Uh, I will say in the financial sector, um, there's more awareness and more discussion at the board level um, about the concerns about financial security and, and uh, cybersecurity. But many other boards of manufacturing or retail are not having these kinds of discussions. So what one of the things that helps is to create a, a risk committee or a technology or security committee of the board um, to bring on to the board someone who has some knowledge about cybersecurity and uh, uh, me, information let me, security. Let me just press on that. Say you have the committee. Say you even have some folks on the committee who understand something about technology. What's the difference uh, or the set of markers between a subcommittee that's asking the right questions and getting the right information versus one that's less effective? The, uh, the difference is in some of the best practices they perform. You mentioned insurance is one, in the, one of them having cyber insurance. Only 51% uh, of companies even have that. Secondly is having an outside assessment, having a Verizon or someone else come in and give you a second or third opinion of the operation that you have and the maturity of the operation. Another is having tabletop exercises and actually the board participating in those. Another is to be able to have uh, regular audits and uh, discussions about the budget towards security. Um, in, financials, in the financial sector, the regulators are pushing for this, and at first we fought it, but I think it's a good idea, having an independence of the CISO reporting to committee or to the board so that you know that the resources are right that they're getting. Um, having the kind of security training that all employees have to go through and the C-suite and uh, the board on that. You're still, it, it, it goes back to when we were talking about what causes the failures, it's still processes, technology, and people. Two of those are not technology related. And those are things that a board can have uh, an impact on understanding the processes and the training that goes on within the firm. And then lastly, having a, an appropriate crisis management team put together, because it's not if you're going to be hacked, it's when you're going to be hacked, and having the plans in place for mitigating that from both a technological point of view, but also a reputational point of view. And that's where, um, again, you'd be alarmed if you saw how many companies still do not have those practices in Can place. So one thing, I, I mean, if you think about a board's ultimate duty, it's to manage and reduce risk. I mean, that's really what the board of directors probably primary fiduciary responsibility, certainly in, in the commercial world, is to really manage and reduce risk. And the way they do that is not showing up at work and writing firewall rules or hiring people. It's just asking a lot of questions and then forcing a lot of things to the table to make sure that the people who are running the business actually have answers. So if you're a retailer and you watch Target take place and you're on the board of a large retailer, you should be saying, how do we make sure that we've run the exercise so that if this happens to us, there is no way that this is what our motion looks like. And so it, it starts there. And I think more boards are getting better at it, but there's still a really it's a long, long way to go. go. But Andrew, you brought up a point earlier about the, the your White House analogy. Another thing I think boards are beginning to understand is to look at what we call the crown jewels. What is the information or the systems that most need to protect it? Because there's just no way you can continue to up your budget and up your budget. But if you understand what's the most valuable things that you need to protect. That's where you put most of your resources. We're lobbying for upping the budgets, but that's for biased. Yeah. Yeah. Ray, you've been on boards for a long time. What questions do you ask? What do you, what do you push management for? From a cyber point of view, exactly. uh, just uh, do you even have any uh, policies that you can prove to me that, that, that you've implemented them correctly? That's the first thing. We do have lots of policies, PCI, <laughs> ERC, SIP, all that stuff. Um, the, that's one. Second, what, how much do you spend and are your people trained? And what general employee training do we do? For example, uh, uh, an audit committee of a public company, uh, we bought a bunch of uh, new printers from Hewlett Packard. I'll just say the name. We installed them and guess what? They were, you know, Swiss cheese. And as soon as we put them in there, the whole network was compromised. We didn't know that 
for quite a while. But uh, that was an example where there should have been some testing of that printer before by us, by the company. Before, Hewlett Packard should have done it too, but by the company so that we knew that we weren't going to mess our own thing up. What if you're acquiring another company? What, what if you go, you know, should you acquire a company without evaluating their network and their capabilities and their safety and so forth? I mean, I got to tell you, uh, in, in, at Red Seal, we've seen cases of M&A where there were back doors on routers that we discovered in the process of helping someone do an M&A. It's like those back doors were going overseas and money was flowing. And not even the, the target company knew it. So, I mean, that's just simple things. It's like, you know, believe me, I've been in a lot of M&A transactions where we go through the files and we go through, we read every letter, we, you know, we get audit reports. All this. Likewise, we should have, the board should be asking, do we know what we're acquiring and are we increasing the risk to my company when I go acquire that deal, and that is not being asked. Well, and you bring up the M&A issue that right now, uh, large the targets for cyber hackers are M&A firms and law firms right. to look at deals. Oh, law. Right, yeah. Oh, gosh, yeah. The side of that and to manipulate yeah. that market. And many law firms and many M&A firms aren't even aware that they've been breached. Right. right. Let me ask uh, just one last question before we go to the audience. Um, Jonathan, we've, I think we all chatted a bit about uh, skills. Yes. And the importance of building out cybersecurity skills. Um, in an organization where you don't have access to some of the uh, leverage around options and comp and so forth that uh, are available to others, how do you think about building out cybersecurity skills? What's it take? So certainly it has been a challenge um, in a couple of different ways. And so first off, uh, actually building that expertise is one option that you have. Uh, but what ends up happening is a lot of times the, the aptitude of the individual is different from the experience or the training that you're able to give them. There are folks that are out there that are truly grew up in this, understand it, can actually do things. And we have a hard time identifying the difference between those two people. I can go to and get somebody that has a commercial certification on CISP or CEH or whatever one that's out there. But actually differentiating that from somebody else that can go and compete at uh, professional hacking competitions like I've done um, is a difference. Uh, and so what ends up happening is, is we have a hard problem of quantifying the skill set of an individual because the field is so diverse. Um, the and aptitudes so new. Uh, are so new. So some pieces of it's new and some pieces have been around for a very long time. Um, it's certainly uh, much more uh, public now, but uh, we're taking anywhere between three to four years to take somebody up to the level that we actually need them to. Um, and that's because we don't have the ability to identify uh, new recruits whenever they come in. And some of uh, the best recruits that we've had were actually sonar techs. Uh, these are the guys that go underneath submarines uh, and operate the sonar system. Uh, it turns out that uh, some of them have a great aptitude for, uh, for cybersecurity and just have never had the opportunity to be able to do it. And so there's a serious challenge there in identifying who has this aptitude. What's the single biggest skill set that's um, hard to develop? What's, your, what's the biggest gap you're thinking? <sighs> Malware analysis, reverse engineering, understanding binary level of being able to take a piece of malware and figure out what it does. That's a skill set that's incredibly difficult to actually develop and use. Uh, because it requires levels all the way down to um, the internal workings of the computer. Uh, certainly it's one of the highest ones out there uh, and most difficult one to actually train. But the other piece is, is um, like we were talking about earlier with big data, uh, analytical skills in recognizing new techniques in order to look for things. So um, recognizing ways in which we can look through that big data. Uh, it's a different thing. It's not as technical from uh, a skill set of an individual knowing how the internals of Microsoft's operating system work, but it is certainly very difficult to actually do because you're, you're dealing with something that is the size of the Mississippi. It's a huge stream and you're looking I for mean, uh, a very small amount of water inside that. And so what ends up happening is, is the skill set of the analyst is another piece of it too. So really reverse engineering, and the aspect of that and then this figuring is, out how This to is where public policy actually is really, really important mm -hmm. because uh, by the year 2025, the number of science, technology, engineering, and math, the STEM students, aren't going to be coming from the United States, Canada, UK. Yeah. Most of those people will be coming from Morocco. They'll be coming from Saudi Arabia, Peru. Do we have the immigration system set up here in the United States that are going to allow those people to come in here and work? 
Do we have you know, education policy that'll help us adjust that today so that we have more of those STEM students coming from the United States and the Western world? We've got to make those decisions now because 2025 is less than 10 years away. So that, that stuff's hugely important. Okay, lightning round. Andrew, in 10 seconds, greatest cause for optimism or pessimism? Both. <laughs> Either. Uh, <laughs> pessimism, we have to realize that we're fighting, for lack of a better word, a war that is completely fundamentally different than anything we've done for a few thousand years, and we better wake up and realize we better start all over in terms of how to fight it. Ray. Optimism. We're human beings. We created the problem. We can fix the problem. <laughs> Tim. Optimism. I think that uh, despite all of the reports of attacks and so on, it's actually, uh, you know, simple computer hygiene is very effective at mitigating a lot of these attacks, maybe not the advanced ones, but I do have a great sense of optimism. Commander. Pessimism. It's all about rate of change. So the problem that we have right now is, yes, we're getting better. Yes, they're getting better. The question is, is who's going to overtake whom? Uh, having run red teams in the past, uh, it was very infrequently that I was not successful at hacking into somebody. <laughs> Every time we tried to find a way in, and we did, um, type of thing. So certainly as the threat surface area increases, now there's more opportunities for the attacker. Yes, we're going to get better on our stuff, but uh, truly pessimistic because I think the rate of change is the key. Kathy? Pessimism, um, and it's because this is a very complex problem. It's a global issue. It requires many sectors to work together and have an incentive to do that. And John and I were just talking about, I was at a West Point event uh, three years ago as one of the few private sector people, and the military people were talking about how the traditional military industrial complex were lobbying against money being spent towards cyber, because that means there's less money for ships and planes and bombs. All right, I think we have time for one or two questions from the audience. Okay, we have someone right up front here. Thank you. If perimeter defense um, is not adequate at protecting enterprise and industrial networks, as seems to surface from the panel, how far are we from enter enterprise-grade solutions that could protect perhaps a network from within or other creative solutions? I guess. Sure. Jonathan? So I've certainly seen um, a lot of development that over recent years of, of trying to be able to go beyond signature based into heuristics and noticing when one person acts abnormally, they log in at midnight whenever they never work between, except between eight and, and uh, nine and five. Um, so certainly there's a lot of investment in capabilities for that. Um, it hasn't penetrated all of our networks yet uh, type of thing, but it's certainly where things are going, recognizing that um, Yes, there's insider threat, but the other piece of it is, unbeknownst to, to individuals, they are the vector that they get in there. And so the more and more we're starting to increase our defenses against internal perimeter defenses being compromised. The key there is you have to look at it saying when, not if, and look at each individual component and making sure that if that gets compromised, the rest of the mission doesn't get destroyed. And I'll, I mean, it's a little bit of sort of a shameless plug, but I will say that I came out of the world of the perimeter firewall, and after 15 years, threw in the towel, and myself and my co-founder had that thesis, and we started a company that built software that we sell to large enterprise predominantly, and our entire mission statement is to come in and say, your perimeter's fine or it's not. That's not, you know, something that you're going to be able to rely on for the rest of your life. We're going to help you with segmentation and compartmentalization and shopping up the inside because a bomb will go off, and when it does, we want to reduce and shrink that blast radius as much as possible. So we're building a company to basically try and solve exactly that problem. That was our thesis from the beginning. Yeah, That's the, a good the, one. The, the, the challenge here with perimeter fence is we don't live in a perimeter world anymore. We right. all have our own, we have multiple phones, there is right? No, is there a perimeter? Right, we've got yeah. tablets. <laughs> the real perimeter here is identity. Right? Yeah. It's the identity that you're using to authenticate and access information. So protecting identities is super, super important. And that's why I'm so optimistic about the cloud is because once you have identity in the cloud, it doesn't matter what device you're accessing that information from. It's all about the identity and the information that you're trying to protect. Identity and access. You just got to know who you are, but also whether right. you're allowed to touch it. That's right. right. You got to right. be able to prove who you are, and you got to actually have rights and privileges to get access to different information. Second question or another question? Up front. So um, it, it's hard to deny that a cyber attacks on uh, industry affects uh, affects government and vice versa. And uh, you know, even with a dedicated U.S. Cyber Command, you know, Andrew, you're you're a proponent of 
having a, a separate military branch for cyber. I did. Um, I wrote a piece. You know, there's still a disconnect. What can we do to move towards providing mutual support between government and industry? I mean, the 10 second answer is I wrote a piece last summer called The West Point for Cyber, which Fortune was kind enough to publish. It was under my name, not the company's, because my thesis was we're broken, it's systemic, and we better figure out how to fix it quickly because the rate of change is so severe. And the short version was there was one piece of the, there was one paragraph in the piece that called out the fact that when the public and private sector realize that we're defending effectively the entire surface area together and we better figure out how to get along and work together because one side is now so interconnected to the other that you don't get to win here and lose here, that will be a big step, just recognizing that, operationalizing it a lot harder. You know, part of the challenge here is that the government has multiple roles. They, they're a user of the internet, so they're like a big company, lots of users, they've got customers called citizens. They're also a protector of the internet from a national security and, and public safety perspective, so they're protecting our rights to use this. But they're also an exploiter of the internet. And so they're developing capabilities to do warfare and military espionage and so on. And so it's, that makes it very difficult, I think, or more challenging to work out roles and responsibilities between all of the different stakeholders in the environment, right? Because we can disclose information about vulnerabilities and malware and all of this to parts of the government, but then is it reciprocal to the industry? Do we actually get that? Is it true information sharing mm -hmm. or is it just reporting? Which is the tension I think I've yeah. seen for many years. Uh, yeah. And with that, I think we're at time. Can we get a round of applause for all our fantastic panelists? Mm -hmm.